So hello everyone, welcome, a warm welcome to all of you on behalf of HEC Paris. On behalf also of the board, of the faculty and all our teams, we hope you are all keeping very well during these unprecedented times. At HEC, as an academic institution, we believe that the current situation lends itself to reflection. And for us, the best way to support you is to share the analysis of, of our professors at HEC. So today for this presentation, you will hear uh, Veronique Nguyen, one of our professors, for about 30 to 40 minutes. And then you will have the opportunity to ask her questions in the chat box. There are many of you with us today, and we'd like to thank you for this, and we will do our best to respond to your questions. So today, Véronique Nguyen, who's a joint professor at HEC Paris, is going to speak to us about the art of self-reinvention. So I would like to thank you, Véronique, very much for being here with us today, and also to thank Nicolas Boucater, who's here also on behalf of all the Lebanese community. And Véronique, I leave you the floor and the microphone to talk to all of you. Thank you very much, and don't hesitate to ask questions to all of you. Thank you. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, so there is no word of introduction. Uh, no, no. Okay, Nicola. so okay, so I, I start. So uh, a warm welcome to uh, all our friends from Lebanon. Uh, so I think I have a problem because I cannot move my slides. So just a second. Okay, so uh, first of all, what I would like to say is that uh, I have no lessons to give to the Lebanon people because I think that uh, you're one of the most inventive, one of the most resilient people in the world. Uh, our Indian friends have been very successful in promoting their ability to uh, innovate. So they have this slogan, you get innovation. But uh, I've asked my Lebanon friends in Paris, and they told me that uh, there was an equivalent uh, in Lebanon who could be Dabera. Okay, so I'm sure that uh, I could learn a lot from you. And um, maybe uh, during um, the second part of this webinar, you can take part in the conversation and tell me more about uh, your ability to do Dabera, right? So the topic of the day is self-reinvention. And there are many different cultures that have different models. So our American friends, they have uh, an icon of the pop culture like Madonna, who has demonstrated throughout time her ability to self-reinvent herself. As French people, uh, we, have, we are fond of the arts and uh, maybe we would not choose uh, Madonna as a model of self-reinvention, but uh, maybe more Jean Cocteau. So as uh, some of you may know, he's an incredible artist. So he started his career as a novelist, as a poet, as a playwright, but he was also a filmmaker. He was a designer, he was a painter, he was a ceramist. So that's a good example of someone having been able to self-reinvent himself throughout his life, right? Um, so why should we or why do people or do organizations self-reinvent themselves? So one first explanation will be is that they have too much life force, right? So if you're like Jean Cocteau, you have a lot of uh, vital energy, you have a lot of talent and you want to express all those talents in life. On your screen, you should be able to see a video of a bamboo. And uh, I chose this metaphor of a bamboo because I think that bamboos are incredible plants and they have a characteristic. And this characteristic is of um, a lot of value for us today because this is a plant that is impossible to eradicate. So if you want to get rid of bamboo, so if you have a bamboo in your garden, it will be impossible to get rid of the bamboo. Why? Because they are growing vertically, 
but they are also growing horizontally. So there are these uh, rhizomes in the ground. These are there's a network of roots and they grow and it's impossible to control their growth, all right? So we'll be discussing the metaphor of the bamboo later on, but uh, just to give you a, a first hint of uh, what is my source of inspiration, of, of course, it's nature, it's a, a plant like bamboo. And I think that bamboo, they exemplify very well why you should, or you can reinvent yourself. It's because you have a lot of vital energy, right? But of course, you may have to reinvent yourself because you have no choice, all right? Because you are declining, because you're experiencing a form of a collapse, right? And what I would like to say as a person who has a mixed origin, so as you may have imagined from my name, I'm half French, half Vietnamese. And I think that I can maybe bring to you today the best of the two cultures. And in the Eastern world, uh, we, we don't believe in stability. We believe in permanent change. And that's why I chose uh, this icon of uh, the Tai Chi Quan, and which, monst uh, which demonstrates that uh, everything is in perpetual transformation, right? So you have a yin force that will transform itself into a yang force and nothing stays the same. So nothing will last forever, right? So I don't believe in stability. I don't believe either in, uh, in a force of uh, permanent growth. So I don't believe that uh, market can grow forever. I don't think that GDP can grow for forever. I don't believe either as something that is a permanent decline. I rather believe that uh, decline is going to decline, all right? And after decline, there is rebirth, there is renaissance, and there is always light at the end of the tunnel. Huh? So here is um, on your screen a sinusoid, and a sinusoid is a kind of a, a model for uh, um, or a simplified um, representation of time for Eastern people. But I would say that it is extremely simplified because I don't think that uh, the world oscillates around uh, an horizontal line, all right? I think that the world is more like a fractal, right? And if you have a fractal, you have a lot of cycles embedded in cycles, right? And uh, you are experiencing cycles, ups and downs as individual. But as a member of a community, as a member of a country, or as a member of organization, you're also experiencing ups and downs. And those cycles, they also make up, uh, they're also part of uh, the cycle of the planet. They are part of the cycle of uh, the universe. And uh, if I had to represent uh, um, the universe or the Tao, which is a source of inspiration for me, I would say that it looks like more like that. So, many, many different cycles embedded in one another. Huh? Um, so um, my conviction, my belief is that all human beings experience at one point or the other a collapse in their life, a reset in their lives. So whether it is at an individual level or at a collective level, you will have to face a form of another of a collapse, All right? So you may lose your job, you may lose a beloved one, you may go through a divorce, uh, you may go through a war, all right? So uh, this is a form of another of a collapse. And as I was telling you, I think that everything is in perpetual transformation. And after the collapse, there is a rebirth. And in this rebirth, there's an hidden gift, all right? And uh, you have on your screen a picture of a wonderful tree. And as you may see, this tree is growing in a very arid, barren land, all right? So it's almost a miracle that we have this kind of tree growing in a landscape that is so uh, desertic, all right? And uh, that's why uh, the Chinese and especially the Japanese people, they are fond of bonsai. So, you know, these little trees, because they think that uh, if you have a little tree like this one, it's so full of uh, vital energy that uh, it is going to reverberate this energy in the house or in the garden that you're going to put it, right? And 
I have chosen this uh, image because I think that it's a good depiction of uh, what I want to impart to you. Because um, when you experience a collapse, uh, uh, you will have uh, the privilege to have a gift, all right? And so that's why what I'm like, what I like to talk about is not post-traumatic stress, but post-traumatic growth, all right? And there's a current of research, and uh, I've mentioned the, um, the name of the article that uh, you may read after this uh, little webinar, that tells you that um, uh, basically people that experience uh, a trauma or a collapse, they may find five types of different gifts, all right? So one of the gifts may be a personal strength, okay? So after an ordeal, okay, you, you have a better self-confidence because you have demonstrated uh, how strong you are, all right? How resilient you are. Uh, secondly, you may experience new possibilities, okay? So you discover new possibilities. Then you may find new relationships or improve relationships with people that you know or get to know. Then another hidden gift after a trauma or after a collapse is that you have a better appreciation for life, right? So the simple fact of uh, watching the sunrise, of seeing uh, a ray of light, of uh, tasting uh, water, and you're very grateful for all those gifts uh, that are given to you in life. And the fifth are hidden gifts that you may have when you go through a, a trauma or a collapse is that you may grow spiritually and you have a better connection with the divinity, right? So that's for me very inspiring because even though you have downs, then you can grow again thanks to these uh, gifts that are given to you by means of this uh, ordeal that you are going through, right? So I would like to share with you now seven elements of reflections about self-reinvention, all right? Seven key points that I think that are important uh, to have in mind, seven also stories that I'm going to share with you and that may be a source of inspiration, all right? So uh, the first key message that I would like uh, to tell you is timing, right? So timing is extremely important. Uh, so I, I ex explained to you earlier in the webinar that uh, my vision of time is not linear, it's more cyclical. It can be uh, represented by means of a sinusoid and there are ups and downs, right? So if you anticipate the decline, right? And you try to reinvent yourself like Jean Cocteau or Madonna before you reach the bottom, the transformation that you will have to go through will be less painful. Why? Because you're going to have more time, you're going to have more resources, but you will have to pay attention to signals that are pretty weak, right? If you are at the bottom of the curve, then it's more difficult because you have basically, you have no choice. That's a necessity for you to reinvent yourself, right? So I would like to give you an example that we will discuss also later on. This is the example of uh, this very famous company, uh, Backberry. So that's a Canadian company. And you can see that uh, um, their sales have been growing until uh, uh, late 2011, right? Even though their main competitor, Apple, launched the iPhone in 27, right? So you can see on this graph that there's a discrepancy between the moment you start to decline and the first signal that you should start doing something. Right? So that's why I like very much um, the theory of Hélène. So some of you may have listened to the talk of Hélène uh, yes, uh, last week. No, it was not yesterday, it was last week. And uh, one of the key message of Hélène was that you have to um, develop a portfolio of options, right? And her idea is you have to do that before it's too late, you have no other choice, right? And uh, in the case of BlackBerry, they were so much thriving that they were neglectful 
of uh, this necessity of having a portfolio of options. Another company like uh, Amazon or Google, you know, they are like uh, Jean Cocteau. They are so much vital energy that they are developing this other option very early before they reach the pinnacle. Huh? Uh, I believe that uh, if you start uh, your reinvention very early, you don't have to suffer that much than do that wait uh, for maybe the, the last minute, right? So if you reinvent yourself before it's even necessary, uh, the, the difficulty and uh, the pain you will have to, or the, yes, the problem that you will have to solve will be much easier and you can grow also much faster, all right? So that's uh, why I think that if you know, you should reinvent yourself before it's even a necessity because the earlier you do it, the easier it will be, right? Um, I mentioned the idea of uh, bamboo previously, and uh, I wrote a small article about uh, bamboo organization that I contrast with uh, crystal organization. So I think that some companies, they are really organic and they have this ability to reinvent themselves like bamboo so that they are impossible to eradicate. Whereas some companies are more like crystal organization and they are frozen. It's very difficult for them to change. Right? So they are maybe extremely efficient and extremely effective in their environment but if the environment is changing, then they will fall apart in 2000 pieces, right? So I'm going to give you examples of uh, crystal and bamboo organization. So of course, bamboo organization, they self reinvent themselves at the top of the curve or the top of the cycle. Whereas crystal organization, they wait for the last moment. And one typical example would be Fujifilm, the Japanese company and Kodak, the American company. Right. So um, these are data that are taken from um, a report that has been uh, released by Fujifilm. And uh, you have also uh, uh, the world sales uh, for photographic film. And as you can see, uh, the peak of the cycle was reached in 2001. Right? So basically, if you look at the figures that are on my right hand side, you can see that the first commercial release of a digital camera was in the uh, late 80s. So uh, companies that were main players in this uh, sector, they had more than 10 years to uh, develop new stems, new uh, uh, business models, right? And one company was very effective in doing that, and it was Fujifilm, and another company uh, was pretty ineffective in doing that. So let's look at the figures. Uh, so as you may see, uh, Fujifilm was able to uh, uh, grow its top line by 71% between 2000 and 2018, whereas uh, Kodak sales were divided by 10, right? So for me, a Fujifilm, this is an example of a bamboo organization and Kodak film, this is an example more of a crystal organization. So what is interesting to uh, understand is how can, or how was Fujifilm able to reinvent itself, right? So that's what we're going to see now. So um, there's a book that you could be reading because I think that's a very good book. These are the memoirs from um, the CEO of uh, Fujifilm. His name is uh, uh, Mr. Komori. And he wrote his book about uh, his um, steering of the company, all right? And the name or the subtitle of the book is How Fujifilm Survived and Thrived as Its Corbiness Was Vanishing. So basically, uh, Fujifilm was going through a collapse, right? But Komori was prescient or clairvoyant enough to anticipate the collapse, right? So it was a harsh reality, but he was able to identify it before it actually happened. And he said, okay, we need to redeploy our core strategic assets to new markets that are going to grow, right? So I'm going to give you a few examples of uh, the technologies they had and the way they redeploy them. So they were uh, doing as Fujifilm, 
photographic film, right? And they say, we are good at making films. Are there any other markets where films may be useful? And they say, yes, there's a huge market that is going to emerge. And this market, this is uh, the computer market, this is the television market, this is the smartphone market, because in all those markets, they need screens, right? And to do these screens, they need protective films, right? So by having anticipating this change, they were able to become the number one in this film, uh, in this field, right? Then another example, which I find uh, pretty striking, this is uh, their analysis. They said, okay, uh, we're doing photographic film and this market is going to collapse. So how can we redeploy our talent, our skills? And um, when you are doing photographic film, one of the main components of civil films, this is collagen. And collagen, this is one of the main part of the human skin. So they decided that they could do cosmetics and they launched this brand, Astalift, which is very successful even today in Asia. All right, so they were able to become a, a significant player in the cosmetic industry. Then uh, they said, okay, um, uh, there are technologies, there are skills that we have that we can apply to other markets, but there may be new skills that uh, we can develop and apply to new markets. And that's how they made the switch to uh, pharmaceuticals and medical systems, right? So they were doing um, traditional imaging and they switched to digital imaging and they apply those technologies to the healthcare business, right? So by having grown many different uh, bamboo stems, right, by thanks to their roots, they were able to thrive in spite of the collapse of their core business. So I think it's a very good example and a very inspiring example. Huh? So the, the uh, second key message that uh, maybe you could uh, have in mind is that if you want to reinvent yourself, you should have a broad definition of yourself. So don't have a too narrow definition because if you define yourself as a sprinter, as someone that is excellent at uh, racing 100 meters, then it will be difficult for you to invent new and to be successful in other uh, games and in other events. Right? So I would like to say something about a very common belief that is even um, that is still very widespread today. This belief is that uh, if you want to be excellent today, you need to be extremely specialized, right? So for instance, if we take uh, on, her, on my uh, left-hand side, Kevin Meyer was the uh, world champion for Decathlon. They can, uh, Kevin Mayer cannot beat Usain Bolt, right? Because Usain Bolt, uh, when it comes to a sp sprint, he can run much faster than Kevin Mayer. Right? But uh, specialization does not enable adaptation. I would say that specialization even contradicts adaptation. And someone like uh, Kevin Mayer, may be able to play much better uh, a new game that may appear, right? Or a new sport that may appear than uh, Houston Ball that is hugely specialized in one single type of uh, race, right? And what is even more important is that let's imagine that uh, athletics has become obsolete and that we want to play another game and that uh, the other game may be motorbike racing or car racing, right? So you can see that uh, people that are champion in a former sport, um, they don't have much uh, asset to be successful in the next sport. And the more specialized they are, the less likely they are to become successful uh, in the next sport, right? So that's why the new rule of the game is not being extremely good in one thing. It's to be able to learn extremely fast, right? So uh, learn faster than your competitor, learn faster than your potential competitor, learn faster than the environment. This is the key to reinvention. 
I was mentioning the book by Komori, the former CEO, or is still the CEO of Fujifilm. And it's very interesting because in his book, he tells a story um, that is inspiring. And he says, okay, as a CEO, I'm extremely busy because I have a lot of decisions to make. But at the same time, I am fully, fully aware that if I want to be successful in the future, I need to keep on learning. So one of my job as a CEO is to spend time learning and discovering new stuff. Uh, my colleagues, I can see that uh, there are uh, something in the chat. So let me see. Okay, so maybe I will answer the questions later because uh, these are premature questions. Okay, so one key message for self reinvention is to spend a lot of time learning, right? And uh, Komori would say that uh, in spite of his heavy schedules, he would keep a pile of important articles or books for him to read, and he would never skip them because it's important to anticipate what is going to be key in the future, right? And then I would like to talk, oh, I did something that uh, now I cannot change my slide. Okay, so I have to stop sharing and start sharing again, I think. Okay. So, uh, so I'm very sorry because I'm stuck. So, I oh know, okay, so it's working. Okay. Um, okay, I have to do something because my battery is running low. So give me a moment, I'm coming back. So in the meantime, uh, don't hesitate uh, to ask questions in the chat box. Uh, some of them are already very interesting and we will relay your questions to Veronique at the end of this webinar. Okay, not all of them, unfortunately, but some of them, if we have enough time. Thank you very much and sorry about this. So I'm very sorry for that. Okay, then the fourth key message that I would like to share with you is lucidity. All right. And um, uh, what is important, all right, and one of the key lessons that we can learn from companies that have not been able to self-invent themselves is the lack of lucidity, the lack of ability to face the harsh reality. And I would like to take two examples. My first example is about the Otto Group, right? So um, Michael Otto, who was the head of the Otto Group, which, which was at the beginning of uh, the 21st century, the biggest distance retailer in the world. This is what this guy would say, all right? We are already among the largest internet company worldwide, right? And he said, internet is just a new channel for us, right? And this is incredible because you have a guy who is extremely successful. We can see the, the emergence, the rise of Amazon and says, okay, um, our business model is not questioned by the rise of Amazon. What we are currently doing is perfectly fit with the new environment, right? So the threat of these new competitors was completely, I would say, minimized, disregarded, right? So this is a completely wrong diagnosis because internet company, e-commerce was a huge threat for the older retail industry. Let me give you uh, two elements to prove my point. Um, uh, the first thing is that as a, a mail order company, you would usually or you would necessarily publish a catalog, right? So if you have a catalog, you have a list of items that you need to have in stock, plus you have a price for those items, right? And the problem is that if you have a price for this item, you cannot adjust the price accordingly to uh, the demand, right? So the, the business model of the mail order companies was to start with a very high price and to decrease the price during the season and to attract customers with promotions. Right? And with the emergence of e-commerce, 
the old business model was completely shattered. Why? Because when you are um, a client, it's very easy for you to compare the different prices and you have an immediate feedback on the internet. And when you see a mail order company with a price of uh, uh, 30 euros, there's no reason for you to spend 30 euros on something that you can buy at 10 euros immediately, right? So the whole business model of the mail order companies was threatened, was disrupted by the emergence of e-commerce. And it's, it's really um, striking to see that uh, the main players didn't have, uh, were not clear-sighted enough to uh, admit, uh, to acknowledge this fact, right? Let me take you also another famous example we were discussing previously the example of BlackBerry. And these are a few remarks that were made by top executives of BlackBerry just after the release of the first iPhone in 2007. So that's what the CEO at the time was saying. Oh, we will be fine, right? And uh, the CEO was pointing at all the shortcomings of uh, the, the iPhone, right? So there's really... Um, um, a challenge for companies that have to self-reinvent themselves, which is to identify signals as real signal and not uh, bury their heads in the, he in the sand. Huh? Uh, concerning BlackBerry, you will see that uh, this, the top executives of BlackBerry were not the only one. If you listen to Steve Balmer, you will have... Uh, um, a very, I uh, would say, um, a good example of uh, wrong diagnosis. Let's listen to him if it's working. But let me start it. Zoom, if, if I may. Zoom uh, was getting some traction, and Steve Jobs goes to uh -huh. Macworld and he, he pulls out this iPhone. What was your first reaction when you saw that? <laughs> $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world. And it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. Now, it may sell very well or not. I, you know, we have our strategy. We've got great Windows mobile devices in the market today. We, you can get. Okay. So basically what Steve Ballmer is saying is that uh, he's laughing at the threat of uh, the iPhone because they think that uh, it will never fly. All right, so uh, the people from BlackBerry, they were not the only one uh, taking seriously uh, the threat of uh, the smartphone. Right. Uh, then the fourth um, message that I would like to share with you is, uh, of course, don't make a wrong diagnosis, but also don't apply uh, decisions or don't apply solutions that will make your problem worse. Huh? So uh, I would like to uh, mention a study that has been made by the French military. And uh, this is a metaphor for how we react as human beings in situations that are extremely stressful. Huh? So the French military, they wanted to uh, uh, analyze how soldiers were reacting when they were under fire. And basically what they said is that uh, there are two dysfunctional behaviors. The first dysfunctional behavior is paralysis, right? You are under so much stress that you don't do anything. Huh? Uh, the second uh, problem is that you so much panic stricken when you are under fire that you can take any decision even if this decision uh, does not solve your problem because you need to release the tension and you need to do something, right? So they prove that uh, uh, if you need two bullets to reach a target in uh, training conditions, when you are in the fire of a battle, you will uh, shoot 200 bullets, okay? So 100 times more, right? So uh, if we take these two examples or these two dysfunctional behaviors, uh, you can say that uh, decision paralysis uh, that was exemplified by the case of uh, BlackBerry. Right? So uh, for many years, the executives of BlackBerry, they decided to stick with the keyboard, even though Apple had invented the touchscreen keyboard. 
right? So paralysis, we stick with what we have. Right? And um, a good example of uh, uh, decision that is inspired by uh, necessity of doing something, even if doing something doesn't solve the problem, may be the case of mail order companies. So those companies, they were groups made up of uh, um, dozens of subsidiaries. And all those subsidiaries, they were pretty independent, right? So when the sales of the mail order companies started to decline, they said, oh, we have to do something. We are going to collapse. And the decision that they took didn't help at all to solve the problem. And worst, right, it made the problem even more serious. So why? Because they say, okay, there are many, many subsidiaries. All those subsidiaries, they are run independently. And we are going to do something uh, that are going to, that is going to make them work more uh, in a more synergic way. All right. So we're going to build commonality. We're going to have common purchases. We're going to have common IT. We're going to have common marketing. And by doing this, they killed, I would say, the um, the innovation, the uh, flexibility that there was in these groups. Right? So they strengthen the crystal to the detriment of the bamboo. And in the end, uh, they died. Right? So the solution that were taken made the problem worse. Right? Uh, the fifth key message that I would like uh, to uh, discuss with you now is the, the importance of emotions. Right? So when you go through a collapse, it's inevitable that you will have negative emotions, all right? You will have sadness, you will have anger, you will have fear. And uh, the challenge is to go through all those negative emotions and to see uh, uh, the bright spot, to see uh, the, the bright future that is awaiting you, right? And if you're able to do that, then you may have very nice surprises. So I would like to discuss now two examples that I find inspiring. So the first one is uh, the example of Qatar Airways. And uh, this is a very interesting example. And in France, we have heard of it because it is run, well, the head of the strategy of Qatar Airways is a Frenchman. So that's why uh, we were aware of that. Uh, so uh, it's very uh, interesting because uh, they had a reaction that was completely different than uh, the uh, typical classical airline company. And in spite of uh, the uh, health crisis, they were able to uh, grow their market share from 5% to 18%. And it's very interesting to listen to uh, the head of uh, uh, the strategy of Qatar Airways because uh, in one of his interviews, he says, okay, we decided not to panic. And we decided to uh, find opportunities in this crisis, right? And one of the things that uh, they said, they say, we're going to uh, uh, build loyalty for our clients by uh, repatriate national that were stranded in foreign countries, all right? So they were uh, the company that was the most helpful in bringing home people that were stranded in foreign countries. And they brought home almost 100,000 people that were not in their home country. Plus, they put the emphasis on the fret, and they were able to, to maintain their fret business. And by means of doing that, they have been able to minimize their losses and uh, to, to survive much better than the others. But what is interesting is that that's the mindset of uh, the leaders that enable that. So instead of panicking, instead of uh, saying to themselves, OK, we are doomed, that's the end, we will not able to recover. They say, OK, we're going to do something different from the other airlines and we're going to, uh, to, to, to grow our business and to uh, plant seeds for the future so that uh, people re will remember us as a company that was extremely helpful during this harsh time. Uh, the second example that I would like uh, to present to you tonight uh, is the example of Argentina. So this is a very recent example because it dates back to the uh, 10th of October. 
And uh, in France, I was not aware of it. But as I am reading The Economist, uh, I, I found the story and I would like to share the story with you because Argentina, as you may know, this is a, a country that has defaulted two times in the last 20 years. So it defaulted in 2001 and in 2020. Right? And uh, the prime minister made a move extremely audacious uh, in the last days. So he decided to double the size of the country, right? By taking advantage of um, United Nations ruling, right? So I don't know how far it's going to take them, but at least it, it, it's, it's a bold move and it's going to give them a lot of negotiating power. Okay, so instead of uh, grieving um, uh, a past that is gone, taking advantage of the opportunities, taking advantage of the fact that everyone is focused on the health crisis, enables you to take uh, decisions and move that can open up a, a bright future. Uh, then the sixth point that I would like to, to make, and I think I have to do it uh, very fast because it's almost a quarter to, uh, to six, is that uh, uh, in, in, the, in the Chinese language, there is no uh, direct translation to be, uh, to be lucky or to be fortunate. So the exact translation is that you have to catch the key that is passing by. So the key, um, that's uh, the energy. And uh, you have a video of a guy that is paragliding. And I like this uh, spot very much because it is showing you that in nature, that there are currents and that uh, some currents, they are soaring. These are rising currents, right? So if you are attentive enough, if you, uh, if you look for opportunities, you will find currents that are going to lift you up. So that's why it's extremely important to, be, to have this positive mindset because you will find the opportunities. Contrary to people that are uh, in a more uh, sad mood, right? So if I have time, I will uh, tell my own story because in the last six months, I've experienced a reinvention myself, but uh, I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to run out of time. But uh, I can tell you that all that I'm saying to you, I have applied it to myself, right? Then I will reach my uh, seventh message and it's time for me to, uh, to finish on that. Uh, so my seventh message is that you have to manage contradiction because if you have listened to me carefully, uh, you would have noticed that I have insisted on two things that may sound contradictory. So the first key message that I was telling about Fujifilm is, uh, well, you have to be lucid, you have to face reality, so you have to be realist. But at the same time, if you want to find the opportunities, if you want to find the bright post, you have to be positive and enthusiastic. So how can you manage this contradiction, all right? And my point is that it's not all, it's end, all right? So you have to be both lucid and enthusiastic, all right? And uh, at HEC, we have this uh, metaphor of uh, the, the expander. The challenge is to be the two things at the same time, all right? When you have a couple of attitudes that are opposite, but at the same time complementary, you need to be strong in both direction. Why? Let's take this example, this first example, all right? Uh, so self-confidence may uh, be, uh, to a certain extent, uh, the opposite of humility, all right? And our point is that you have to develop uh, uh, humility at the same time of self-confidence. Otherwise, you will fall into the trap of over self-confidence, which is arrogance, right? And conversely, you need to be uh, self-confident when you are humble. Otherwise, you will fall into the trap of insecurity, right? So that's why you need to be both things at the same time. And if we apply this logic to the couple of uh, uh, lucidity and enthusiasm, 
right? You will see that you need to be both of them because if you're too lucid, you're going to be depressed, you're going to be disenchanted. And if you're too enthusiastic and not enough lucid, you'll become, you're going to be naive and stupid and maybe gullible, all right? So the challenge is to be both at the same time, all right? So that will be uh, my final message. And if I need to uh, summarize all that I've been saying so far, I think that there are seven key takeaways that you may uh, keep in mind for later when it comes to self-reinvention. So the first message is timing. The sooner, the better, if you need to self-reinvent yourself. Second message, have a broad definition of yourself. Uh, third definition, learn fast. Fourth uh, message, you need to face reality. You need to, uh, to be lucid. Uh, fifth, you need to transmute, emission, uh, transmute emotion. Sixth message, you need to catch the key that is passing by. And the seventh message, uh, you have to develop both lucidity and enthusiasm. So now I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you so much, Veronique. Uh, this was extremely inspiring and insightful. Thank you. With people like you around, we learn faster, like your third point is saying, and eager to keep on learning. Two questions come up to my mind, if I may. The first, you were saying and explaining that Komori in Fujifilm mm -hmm. have predicted the collapse and acted well in advance. So uh, this, that, does this mean that it's when the crisis hits, it's too late to act. Um, my second question comes from my friend Shakir Saab on the chat. So Shakir is saying that Fujifilm and others reinventing them, reinvented themselves by diversifying. However, he would like to know about their failures. How many times have they failed before succeeding? Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, okay, so for me, it's never too late to reinvent yourself. Uh, the only thing is that uh, if you uh, do it earlier, you will have more resources and uh, it, it's uh, easier. If you wait uh, too long, then it's much more difficult. Right? If we take the example of BlackBerry, they collapsed and then they were able to uh, um, experience a rebirth again but not of the size of uh, the first business they were in. So it's never too late, right? So it's, you, you should never give up. Okay, that will be my first answer. And it's true that um, as Ellen was saying uh, last week, uh, you have to try different things, right? Uh, and you, you never know which one is going to succeed. Right? And her, her advice was, uh, you have to fail fast. Huh? So uh, you need to have uh, different stems and some of the stems are going to succeed and other, they are going to die. But what is important is to grow new stem, right? Is to strengthen your, your roots. And um, when you do that, you have the uh, hope that at least some of the stems that you're growing are going to be successful. Um, um, so, that will be my point, which is a good synthesis with what Hélène said, but I would like to add something else. I think that uh, if you're good at anticipating, you will be good at catching the current that are rising, right? Because it's not true that uh, all uh, uh, currents are rising or are promising as the others, right? If I had time to tell you my own story, uh, I was able to start a business in six months and start, uh, you know, uh, invoicing and have some kind of a success because I was able to pinpoint uh, the wave that was about to start. All right. So when you have limited resources, you better select, um, you know, the project that you're going to invest your time and money in because you're not like a big organization with a, with a lot of resources. So you cannot afford to fail too many times. Thank you, Veronique. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question here, Veronique, uh, in the chat uh, from Antoine. Antoine would like to know how uh, do you reinvent yourself without losing focus? How do you know it's time to change? It's the proper time to change and that the change that you are doing is the proper one. 
Right. So thank you for uh, raising this question of focus, because I think that uh, focus, this is a concept for crystal organization. This is a concept for uh, people that want to be like uh, Usain Bolt. They want to be the champion in one specific uh, sport. But when the world is changing very fast, if you are too much focused, then you're doomed to experience, uh, you know, uh, the decline and the fall. Right. So uh, I don't think that uh, well, that's my point of view. Right. Uh, I don't think that uh, focus, it's no longer something valid in a very dynamic world, because if you're too much focused, then you cannot explore what is going to be the source of success for tomorrow. Thank you, uh, Veronique. So we, we are reading the questions because there are so many of them. There's a question from Roger here who asks, how could we apply this in a collapsed country economy like, uh, like his, country, his economy? Uh, how can you apply this in the context of Lebanon? Yeah. Uh, you know, I've never been in Lebanon and um, I, I hold all Lebanese people in very high esteem. So I, I'm, I'm speaking now, but as I told you at the very beginning of this session, I think I should better listen to you because you have a lot to tell me about resilience and self-reinvention. I think that uh, I don't have any answer because I, I don't know uh, Lebanon, but what is for sure is that in any situation, if, if you have a positive mindset, if you are both able to be facing reality and uh, detecting the bright spots, detecting the waves that are going to emerge, you will be successful, right? I think it, it's really a question of not being uh, hung up by negative emotions because the negative emotions, they prevent you from finding the right stop and they, they prevent you from finding the opportunities. Okay, and Roger says that they are positive, they will adapt, they will survive. <laughs> yes, of course, of course, you're much better than uh, any other people in the world, you know. That's for sure. Um, okay, so it's uh, it's almost six o'clock, so uh, I think we well, there will be many questions, of course, many more, and Veronique, we will share them with you. And um, as uh, already mentioned in the chat, you will receive the link to the recording of this webinar and also a suggested reading list from Veronique, including the books that she mentioned. So thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Veronique, so much. It was really, really very interesting for all of us. Um, but now it's time to, to close this webinar. So we would like to thank you. And the next webinar will take place next week, October the 22nd. And this time it will be with Olivier Siboni, who will take talk to us about decision-making and cognitive biases. So until then, uh, keep very well, very safe, all of you. Um, thank you so much and see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye